Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about Concord and how journalists, and I use this term loosely, have been propping up this dead game like their life depends on it. Why article after article tells you that this game is good, give it a chance. Maybe it's not for you. You're in the wrong. How Black Myth Wukong is siphoning players from Concord. And let, let's be honest, that there's lying to you. Can we just agree that the game was rotten from the start? That it was a blatant clone that didn't invent anything new at all for the genre in a market that is saturated with the graveyard of hero shooters. Can we just agree on that? So if you guys don't know what Concord is, it is a 5v5 hero shooter with the likes of Guardians of the Galaxy smushed together with Overwatch and not really much more than that. Its shelf life has lived for two weeks, it's now closed, and Wired has a very interesting article that I kind of want to discuss and just kind of get their thoughts on. But I feel like, from the whole, journalists have been very pro-Concord and very anti-Black Myth Wukong. And I'm very curious, because it really does feel like access journalism in a lot of aspects, and actually the opposite way. Take that in the reverse. Journalists are no longer the gatekeepers on whether or not something does well or not. And I think for the past, I would say, 30 years, journalists have been that gatekeeper when it came from magazines to online and YouTubers, you know, I would say more content creators have kind of filled that niche. I think the biggest, honestly, the biggest issue with Concord is Concord was made for an audience that, what well, didn't exist. It was made for an audience that they probably were looking at Twitter, they were looking at very outspoken people, and those people are not the target demographic who are gonna buy games. And I'm not saying the version of like, oh, this character is ugly. It is that this character is uninspired. That, that really is the case. The characters were uninspired. They don't have to be quote unquote you know? They don't have to be. I think Deadlock is an amazing example of that. There are some crazy, crazy looking characters. And I guarantee you, if you took Deadlock's character designs and put them on Concord, it would have succeeded. But instead they tried to placate. Instead they tried to placate to an audience that does not want to play these games. And I think the biggest other issue is that it was eight years. Eight year dev cycle. By the time that you're done with this game, it's stale. I think Sony just saw how much money that Destiny 2 and Overwatch 2 and any other live service game that was has a moniker of success was making, and they wanted a piece of that pie. That's why they bought Bungie. They wanted a piece of that pie. And I think journalists right now are very angry because people are dancing on the grave of Concord. And to be honest, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing because that's what's called a free market. I don't think that these journalists actually understand. I think they've been so used to being able to prop up games that they like and they don't like and say bad things about those and good things about these for so many years. And I think these journalists are actually going to probably have killed their own jobs. And I think we're starting to see that now with this general disinterest when it comes to IGN, PC Gamer. There's just a very or just a general lack of interest where YouTubers have filled those niches very nicely. Let's dive in. We've been yapping a little bit too much on this. I want to dive into what Wired is saying on why Concord's death offers a bleak look at gaming's future. So after eight years of development, Sony pulled the plug on Concord today after two weeks. This part makes me question the validity of this journalist. It really does. Fans loved it, but seemingly not enough. Is the future of the industry blockbust or bust? I feel like it's always been that way. I feel like more so now because we have so many live service games and we have quote unquote forever games that yes, you either have you succeed or fail. Unless you have a very small solo dev, five person dev team that can make enough money to be like, hey, we succeeded, let's make a new game. Let's make another one. But when you have budgets like $200 million, there is only succeed or fail. There is no in between of having just a mediocre launch. So. Earlier this week, after wrapping across the galaxy for 90 hours in a sentient spacecraft, Twitch streamer John Whistleman realized that Concord was the best first-person shooter he has played in a decade. I mean, everyone has their opinion, just like everyone has an asshole, to be honest. I was going to say they had a trailer at the Game Awards or something. Did they? I don't know. Did they have a trailer? It was a flop? I don't Honestly, it was so... It was so unrememorable that, like, I don't honestly even realize they had one. And that's a bad thing. 
If I had a quarter for each time a magazine a journalist has put in the words bleak look at gaming's future, I'd be rich by now. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's definitely there for the clickbait. Everything is turning into a tabloid. Everything is there for the clicks. Doesn't matter if it's true or false or a really bad take. It doesn't matter. You can, you can hook somebody with something completely fake and they stay in the article and they read it. Guess what? You got their ad rev. You know, that is the reality of what journalism is now. But it's just really odd they, they started this article already with fans love it and Twitch streamer realizes Concord was the best first person shooter he's played in a decade. When I would say the audience does not agree with him. I would say the audience vehemently does not agree with him. And they would much rather have Omni Movement Call of Duty or they would much rather just have Overwatch, which is already filling this niche. And there is a graveyard of hero shooters. Just like there's a graveyard of battle royales, yet for some reason this game in particular is getting so much news cycles, and I think it's because it really tried to be inclusive. DEI and inclusivity is a good thing. It actually, it, it really is. It is a good thing to have a wide net and then to have a variety of people's backgrounds and different cultures in your game. It, it's honestly a good thing. A melting pot is a good thing. Concord had the social responsibility to present this in a good way. Not in a, there's a bunch of pronouns and really, really, not even unattractive, just unappealing character designs. Team Fortress 2 had people in red and blue shirts and had a better character designs than this game. These character designs were either overcomplicated or so simple, and it doesn't have to be like, wow, I really want that person to be hot. They have to be interesting. And I think Deadlock does an amazing example of having inclusion and good character designs. So this is really goes down to the fault of the devs and their misguided attempt at, at just, I, I, don't, I don't even know. I honestly don't even know what they were thinking with these designs and how they got approved. Unless Sony just gave them a carte blanche. I, I just, I baffles my mind. Anyway, they go back to say the gunplay was crunchy, the movement was smooth, and the progression felt rewarding. And I would agree. When I watched it, I, I, it looked decent. Did it look amazing? No. If I had to pick a dead game to bring back, I'd bring back Lawbreakers over this game. Law Lawbreakers was a hundred times better than this game. Sony spent $200 million on a clone that really didn't do much from a game design perspective to bring people in. You have to ask yourself when you're a dev, especially when you're a game designer or the creative director of this project, how are you going to pull people away from the market share of other games that have dominated? What are you doing differently? What are you doing that's a spin on it? Like rarely do games that are just pure carbon copies succeed. They don't. And I think in an era, a long gone era, companies used to do that. They would take the same base engine and the same effectively design, put a skin on it and call it a day. They, had a, they definitely had a target audience for this one, and it was the Twitter crowd, hands down. They, their market research team should frankly, and I don't normally say this, should be fired, hands down. If your market research team told you that this is the demographic that was gonna buy your game, and then they don't show up, that's a pretty big oopsie daisy. That's a really, really big oopsie daisy. And I honestly, I, I think what's gonna happen is now the game is offline. They have until March to either write this game off, because we were talking about this earlier, Sony's physical year ends in March. So right now, they have like a 200 plus million dollar loss. That's a that's a big loss. They can claim that on their taxes. So either the game is dead or they bring it back before March. Or they could just say, screw it, we're gonna eat the cost and we're gonna keep building it and we really have faith in this game. I don't think that's gonna happen in the slightest. I, I do not think that's gonna happen. I think they're probably going to try to re-release this game. They're gonna redesign the characters to be more attractive and to be more appealing to the general audience. The argument that everything has to be ultra attractive is, is, is false. It's really false. You can succeed with really interesting characters. He said, this is, I was even more enthralled by the world the developers had created when I looked into the lore. I mean, they pretty much just made budget Guardians of the Galaxy. So yeah, sure, why not? He wasn't alone. One of the biggest perks about the game was the absence of toxicity within the player's community, says Kel Des, a content creator at KD's Games. Everything about the game was positive and inclusive. When you can literally direct message your whole audience, of course there's not going to be toxicity because nobody is playing your game. When you don't have an audience, you're not even going to get the bad actors. 
So I, I feel like this was a, just a really weird stance. On Wednesday, less than two weeks after the game's August 23rd launch, Sony announced that it was taking Concord offline. While many qualities of the experience resonated with players, we also recognized the other aspects of the game and our initial launch didn't land the way we intended. If you can't get people in the door, then you can't get them to stay for gameplay. Now, when your marketing fails that bad and people vehemently disagree with your design of your characters from when they had trailers launched and people were like, ew, what the hell is this? They're not the demographic. Like, who is? Who is your demographic then? In fact, we've never seen any AAA game get this type of, type of treatment. And that's what would make Concord a horrifying canary in the coal mine for gamers and game workers alike. No. No, I feel like this guy definitely has an agenda on what he's trying to say here. When you make a bad game that people don't enjoy and people refund in mass and or just literally the marketing was so bad that you couldn't even get people in the door, that, that's a fundamental failure on the devs. That is not the audience. The audience is a free market. They decide what they like and they don't like. And I think it's very clear that they said, you know what, we don't like this. It's unprecedented for a game of this scale to shut down so quickly. Usually, publishers keep games that struggle at launch on life support for a while, but in Concord's case, the launch was so bad, there was clearly no way back. I, this was probably one of the biggest failures and will probably be a case study on what not to do. And I think it's honest, it's a wake-up call. This is a wake-up call for the industry that I don't think we'll learn. I don't think the industry will learn from this. I think that they will just be like, no, no, I'm not the problem. No, 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 it's the audience. The audience, they're the problem. Sony as a business will have to wake up eventually and be like, man, you know what? We can't keep burning money like this. This is an embarrassment. This actually just hurts their brand. And it honestly hurts DEI and inclusivity more than it helped it. That's the crazy part. And it's unfortunate. It's just a very difficult to break into competitive multiplayer games and displace the existing top titles. Again, yeah, these are forever games. You have to compete against those. It can't be you release a mediocre title and then hope that you can siphon off a couple hundred thousand people. Like that's, this is that's you you are foolish to think that. These are the kind of titles that players socialize with their friends in, and they often not motivated to switch games. That is very true. Like once you're invested in a game, you have to give a reason to switch to another game. Sony hasn't revealed how many copies of Concord sold between August 23rd and September 3rd, but the number of active PC players on the Steam platform peaked at just 697. Just let that sink in, chat. This game could not even get above a thousand people to play on, on launch day. The biggest day for it. No one played it on Twitch. No one even like mentioned it. I, I didn't see any mention of it at all on launch day. That's an abysmally low number for a major release that spent eight years in development. Again, problematic there. Sony's previous live service game, Helldivers 2, had over 155,000 players on first day back in February and later peaked at almost half a million. When you don't hit a thousand, indie games made in Unity in that take three months can hit numbers better than that. So I think what happened, to be honest, they had to redo their game. You don't spend eight years making a game. You don't. Maybe five, max six, and really bad times. But eight? That means that you reset your game. But you have to understand, these guys started this right after Overwatch launched. Eight years ago, when they when they saw Overwatch, they were like, we want to make that. And that's admirable, and that's great. But there was nothing added on top. There was not that second layer. But Helldivers 2, though it was a breakout hit and had already had an established fan base, Concord in the hand was a brand new franchise that didn't get much of a marketing push and drew the ire of anti-woke uh, snivelers who complained about the game's use of pronouns on his character selection screen. I would definitely say that there was, there was definitely some hate there, but I think this goes back to they had a social responsibility to present inclusion in a better light. And that's, that's to be frank. They failed their social obligation to bring a game that had inclusion and was fun. And I use Deadlock as an example. We just talked about that. Like, Deadlock's characters are insanely inclusive. You are playing a vast variety of richly designed characters, and that's what this didn't have. So I feel like this anti-woke stance that a lot of these, you know, quote-unquote journalists are taking is just an excuse for the failure of the devs. I mean, most indies had better games than Skull and Bones and less than half the cut cost. Oh yeah, we're in an era right now, AA, which is kind of the middle of the road they're talking about, but it is a small studio that are making bangers. I feel like we have had a overwhelming amount of good games this year and last year, a plethora of riches. But yet, when these other games fail, they're like, oh, the game industry is going, it's crashing. It's like, no, people are being more strict with how much they spend. Is the game worth it to them? And if not, they're not going to spend. Concord may have gotten off to a slow start with games, most of whom hadn't realized it, heard of it yet. 
And critics who didn't love the initial character designs, but the same could be said about Elder Scrolls Online, would have since made more than $2 billion, or the Destiny franchise for Silver's 10 year anniversary, or No Man's Sky, which has become a cult classic. If those games were released now, would they survive longer than Concord did? Longer than the lifespan of a honeybee? <laughs> the answer lies within the most ruthless beekeepers in the industry, and all they care about is the honey. So I actually agree with that, to be honest. I, I think I think he buttoned it up pretty decently. I think he really did. I think that he makes a strong point here that a lot of these projects, like BG3 was in beta for many years, but they had the runway and budget to do so. It really just kind of comes down to like how much of a runway. And I feel like this is the issue a lot of times, right? These companies have such a short runway when it comes to their funding that they can't weather a bad launch. They can't do a labor of love. I, I think the I think the biggest thing here is that just frankly that Sony bet big, they lost, and now they have to take a really hard look about future of Concord. Is it a tax write-off or are they really gonna sit down and try to make a better game? Because there is no middle of the road anymore. You're either small budget, small team release indie hit, or you're a major AAA game making major AAA money. There is no in-between anymore. We got the Wukongs of the world, and then we have the Suicide Squads. And the reality is we've had a lot of failures. We've had a lot of high-profile failures this, this year. Concord is a brand new game. It had no strings attached. They could have done anything with this game. And they made what they made. So I think time will tell, but I'm not going to hold my breath that Concord comes back. I would love another hero shooter, but I think Marvel Rivals is going to eat their lunch. And I think they know that. I think that's why they were trying to launch now before December, when Marvel Rivals will probably take a huge market share off of Overwatch. And then there is no room for a hero shooter after that. There is none. Concord's a cursed name now? Oh, it is. Oh, definitely. They should frankly rebrand it on top of that. Like they should not use the name Concord. It, it would be a, a, a horrible, horrible mistake for them. People thinking the game failed in terms of like, oh, it's a DEI character. DEI is not a bad thing. DEI uses a bad word, but it's not a bad thing. Inclusivity is always a good thing. It did nothing to make me pull away from Overwatch, which also is inclusive. And I feel like that's not like that. I love this because no one has been mentioning. They're like, oh, they hate, they're, they're, they're racist or these people are anti-woke. What do you think Overwatch is? Overwatch did it, but they did it better. <laughs> Like, Overwatch is one of the most diverse casts you will see in gaming other than Deadlock, and it's succeeding. So I feel like beating on that drum is so, so disingenuine. They did it, and they did it first and better? Yes. They did it better. I mean, Concord was pretty much just a, hey, let me copy your homework, but don't tell anyone that I copied your homework. If a game is not interesting, it doesn't matter if it's woke or not, it won't be playable. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's just... We, we can go on Twitch right now, right? League of Legends, inclusive. Fortnite, inclusive. You can play as fucking Scarlet Witch all the way to a giant Beowsicles muscle cat man. Valorant, inclusive. Deadlock, insanely inclusive. What a Warcraft, inclusive, but pandering, I would argue. Magic wheelchair, I that, that's definitely pandering. Um, Dota, inclusive. So it's just weird that these journalists are really trying to spin this like weird narrative i don't know it just doesn't make sense to me it doesn't inclusivity is always a bonus but it gets more than just that to capture an audience oh exactly no 100 percent. you can't just like throw inclusive sprinkles on top of your game but if the game is rotten or the game does nothing to pull market share away from other games then yeah it's gonna fail but there was such a clear agenda from these from these journalists and it's just actually i think one of the biggest things now thinking about it is that a lot of gamers are older now. I would say that the target demographic, not even target demographic, the majority of gamers right now with the biggest spending power are millennials. Millennials were the ones that grew up with gaming, right? It was in their DNA and sniff out bullshit from a mile away. And I feel like this is kind of, I feel like a lot of articles now are just kind of an insult to your intelligence. Frankly, they really are. They're kind of just an insult to your intelligence. That they expect that these people are not seeing the clear agenda that they're trying to spin, like trying to shit on Black Myth Wukong. It's scary to see, right? It's it's actually really apparent that like a lot of journalists, you know, quote unquote journalist websites now are frankly just actually racist. They don't want they don't want an Eastern game developer to succeed. 
How many bad articles have you seen about Black Myth Wukong and First Ascendant? And how many positive articles have you seen about Concord? It's because they can't control the success of those games and they don't like it. They liked being the access point for if whether or not something succeeded or failed. And they're not that anymore. And it's so crazy to see that.